Morning, everybody. It's about time to get started. This morning we're going to start in uh, chapter, beginning of chapter 11. And let's bow. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the day that you've given us. We thank you, Father, for life and creation and all that's around us. And we thank you so much for your son that you sent to this earth. Father, we just ask that you help us as we continue to look at his life and the things that are written in Mark. Help us to understand these things and help us to apply them to our lives to make us better followers of you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay. Um, this is chapter 11. We're now getting to the point of Jesus entering the city, entering the city of Jerusalem. He's coming from the east. He's coming from um, the Mount of Olives. And so if we jump right into 11, chapter 11, verse 1, what does your Bible say is a section called? The triumphal entry. And I think you're going to see today that it's not triumphal. It's an entry. Okay? It's the entry into to Jerusalem. Um, we do a lot of things in those little comments that tend to shift our thinking about what the, what the section is. Those comments aren't in the original book. Those comments are added by somebody that's, that's doing the interpreting. Um, but we see in chapter 11, verse 1, that Jesus starts off by directing his disciples to fetch a colt. Um, and this is showing either a foreknowledge of what's going to go on, or it's a prearrangement that Jesus has made. Could be either one. And uh, he's predicting what they're going to find. They're going to find an unridden colt, a male colt. It's tied up, and it's close to where they enter the city. And he warns them that they're going to be challenged when they try to take the colt. And he tells them the answer they're supposed to give. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, talks about um, the Messiah coming in on the colt of a donkey uh, into Jerusalem. And so we see this is a, a following after what the prophecy was fulfillment of that prophecy. So Jesus orchestrates a grand entrance into Jerusalem. Those words don't sound like the Jesus we've been listening to so far in Mark, is it? He sets up a grand entrance. What's Jesus been telling all along? Keep quiet. Let's don't get this thing out of control. Yet, here's this grand entrance that comes in. Um, the animal that's chosen has never been ridden. Now that makes it suitable for a king. Um, it's suitable for a sacred purpose. But what happens when, you, when someone sits on an animal for the first time? It's fairly unpredictable, isn't it? Um, and so here Jesus is going to sit on a, on a male colt that's never been ridden. Now, the colt being a donkey is significant. It's not a horse. Okay, it's a donkey. A king on a horse was either going to war or returning triumphantly. A king on a donkey meant what? Coming in peace coming in peace. So that's, that's not triumphal, is it? That's coming in peace. Jesus encourages the public rejoicing by his provocative entrance. So he it's, it's, seems to be making a scene, and people start responding to that. What do we typically call this? 
in today's world when we celebrate this? Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. Okay, that was celebrated a couple of weeks ago by people. But what's more important than the palms here in the entrance? What is said and what do they use? They put their own clothes on over the donkey. The disciples put their clothes on the donkey to have him ride on it. What do they put in the streets? Actually, they're putting the clothes in, according to Mark, and then some leaves or some, some branches from trees. And they're waving branches. Okay? So there's, the clothes seem to be more prominent than even the branches. Okay? Um, what that means, I'm not exactly sure. But it replicates something that we find in 2 Kings chapter 9, verses 12 and 13, which is the way Jehu came in um, and was anointed, the way the garments were used there. So the excitement that generated by Jesus' arrival, what do they say? Hosanna, Hosanna. Where is this from? If you go to Psalms 18, 118, I think you're going to find um, that piece of it, that Hosanna. And let me find that scripture because it comes up later. Psalms 118 and verse 25. O Lord, do save, we beseech you. O Lord, we beseech you. Do not send prosperity. It's, and blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. So this blessing, this Hosanna is being leveled at, at Jesus. Now, he enters the city, this big fanfare, all this stuff going on, and then we have something like an anticlimax. Jesus goes to the temple, and what does he do? He looks around and he leaves. He looks around and he leaves. What's that all about? Why would you go to the temple, look around, and leave? Is he visiting like a tourist? Has Jesus ever been to the temple before? Often. But he's not coming out of pious reverence. He's coming to fulfill scripture. And that scripture, Malachi uh, chapter 3. Go over that. Malachi 3, starting in verse 1. Behold, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come into his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he is like refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And so he comes to the temple. He arrives, he comes to the temple, and he leaves. So is this entry into Jerusalem really triumphal? No, if he had come on a white charger, a white horse, riding into town as a victor, it might have been a triumphal entry. Do the crowds really understand what's going on here? No. They don't. Even the ones that are shouting Hosanna, they don't understand. Now in verses 12 through 33, we see a couple of incidents, again, sandwiched within each other. We see the fig tree incident and the temple incident. And so we need to understand them together as we go through this. 
There's many suggestions that have been offered, and we're going to start in verse 15, and then we'll come back to the other, um, to verse 12 later. But starting in verse 15, Jesus drives out the money changers from the temple, as the section's called. And there's a lot of explanations that have been given to what Jesus' actions here in the temple mean. Some say that he's engaging in an act of insurgency, that he's rising against the, um, the government, the structure, everything else. But the clash is really only a modest engagement with the servants of the temple market, and it's largely symbolic. Most other interpretations attribute Jesus' ferocity to his righteous indignation over flagrant abuses. Some claim that Jesus opposes buyers and sellers because they impede Gentile worship in the outer court. This was in the outer court, the court of the Gentiles. And they're saying that the noisy commerce prevents the temple from being a house of prayer for all nations. There's another view that contends that Jesus' concern for the temple's purity prompts his action, but there's little evidence that this forecourt, this court of the Gentiles area, was considered sacred space. The phrase den of robbers has influenced the most common view, and that Jesus is protesting because the temple has become a crooked business. It's gaining wealth for somebody. Who is that somebody it's gaining wealth for? These were run by the high priest, by Annas. He's the one that's running this and his family. And they're the ones that are collecting all this. And they were very much corrupt. Just some examples. Everybody had to pay a temple tax of six, uh, let's, let's call it six pence. The daily wage was three and a half pence. So this was a fairly sizable sum, wasn't it? A couple days wages. For every other debt, you could pay in any kind of currency, but the temple tax had to be paid in shekels of the sanctuary. Now, if you wanted to convert your currency from Roman to uh, the shekels, it's going to cost you an extra one. And if you want change back from that that uh, conversion, it's going to cost you another one. So almost a half a day's wages just to exchange some money. That's pretty steep, isn't it? If you were to go to an exchange house uh, in an airport as you were going into a different country, you don't want to be ripped off. It costs you something, but you don't want to be ripped off. Here they're being ripped off. The sacrificial system required doves to be without blemish. Blemish. The doves on the outside cost about three and a half. They had to be inspected by inspectors hired by the high priest and were likely to have something wrong. And they were advised then to get the doves inside from the vendors inside and those cost 75 so instead of three and a half on the outside, it's 75 on the inside. Now, the business of buying, selling, inspecting, all belonged to this family of Annas, who had been the high priest. The poor, humble pilgrims were being swindled. Jesus says that the temple is more dangerous than the road from Jer Jericho, which is filled with hiding places or dens for robbers. We have the story that we remember from the Gospels of the, the Good Samaritan, right? Yeah. Being robbed on the way from Jericho. And that's what Jesus is referring to here. Yes? Uh, obviously, these men were simply politicians. These overseers of There's another tax, but there's also somebody wanting something in their pocket, yeah. right? And so somebody has to collect. Has to collect. And so, you know, I, I'm not going to be smirch politicians, but it would be too easy. Uh, so, but I think we can all agree that the thought behind government should be 
It's about the people and what they need and how can I help them. And it's not the way it is in today's society. And that's either party. It seemed to be people out for themselves. And, and I think that's true back then too. Who should the leaders of the Jewish religion be responsible for? The people. They're supposed to be shepherds, aren't they? Are they acting like that? No. They're, they're ripping people off. So Jesus drives out the sellers and the buyers. He doesn't allow them to gather their merchandise. And he's not letting anyone carry merchandise through the temple courts. Because that was another piece that in order to get to the other side of the, the temple, people were just cutting through instead of going around. And so they were interfering with worship that was going on. So how does the crowd respond? It says they're amazed, but it seems like they're baffled. They're not sure what's going on here. You've got somebody in the temple upsetting all this stuff. In Jesus' day, the temple had become a nationalistic symbol that served only to divide Israel from the nations. If it were to become what God intended, a, prayer, a house of prayer for all nations, the walls between those areas would have to crumble. It's far from what God intended. Now if we move on and catch the, the fig tree that's around this, so 12 through 14 and 20 through 25, we have kind of a something that we should be able to tie together to figure out the significance of what's going on in the temple. Jesus didn't in, intend to cleanse the temple. He announced its disqualification. He didn't intend to cleanse it. Mark mentions that the tree did not bear anything more than leaves because it was not the sig season for figs. Would Jesus have known that it's not the season for figs? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's no question about it. He lived in that region. He would know when figs were on a tree. Yet he approaches this fig tree and he sees that it's all leafed out, but there's no figs on it. And what does he do? He curses that tree. Now, if you go up and look at fruit trees up north right now, how much fruit do they have on them? Zero. Unfortunately, you probably don't have many leaves either, but it, they're coming. But as the leaves come on, it looks like a really good tree. But there's no fruit on it. Do we expect it to have fruit in the springtime? We wouldn't expect it to have fruit in the springtime. We'd expect it to have fruit later in the season as the fruit has had time to develop. Because we know this. Why do we know this? experience. We keep our eyes open. We understand these things, right? Well, so Jesus' actions seem outlandish. Why would he curse a tree for not bearing figs out of season? Now as, as what well, they're termed in the literature, moderns, us, we want to have sympathy for the tree. We worry about that tree. It's dying. Jesus has, has uh, cursed that tree for what reason? The tree didn't do anything wrong. Is that really how we should take this? No. But that's, that's sometimes what gets in our way of thinking through what, what Mark's trying to say. The withering of the tree to the, its root within a day points to God's judgment on this fruitless temple. God has judged this temple. Because what is the temple? It looks like a good tree, but it should have fruit all the time, and there is no fruit. He's judging that temple. So it's really the Jewish people he's dealing with here the tree. Well, it's, it's not just the Jewish people, it's more particularly the Jewish leaders. But it's, it's, but, but it's the Jewish leaders that are, that, and the temple itself, because the temple is what? 
what's the temple supposed to be? A worship place, but the place of God on this earth. Okay? That's what it's supposed to be. Is it being treated like that by the leaders? That's being treated as a storehouse where they can gather money, where they can make money. Not take care of the people, but make money. That's what they focus this on. So this, this um, cursing of the fig tree, it's denunci- denunciating the religious corruption that defiles even the most holy things. Jesus knows that it's not fig season, but this is a clue for us to look beyond the surface meaning. Okay, so this barren fig tree represents the barrenness of the temple, that, uh, the temple of the Judaism, that is unprepared to accept Jesus' messianic reign. It's unprepared to accept this reign. And as the fig tree's time is barren, so is the temple's. Time can run out for fruitless trees and prayerless temples. So the location of salvation shifts from the temple to where? To Jesus, his death and his resurrection. It's shifting away from the temple and to Jesus. That's right. They had, they had taken away all God out of it. All right. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's not really that house where God dwells anymore, is it? Okay. Um, so the tree is giving him the impression that it might have something to eat. Just the temple gives the impression that it's a place dedicated to the service of God. Jesus doesn't explain, but instead he places an emphasis on prayer and faith. They reveal the essence of the new order that replaces the old, based on faith that overcomes insurmountable odds, sustained by grace and characterized by forgiveness. Then we get into the spot where he talks about prayer and this mountain taking up and casting into the sea. Being taken up and cast into the sea. And that mountain likely is referring to the Temple Mount, Mount Zion. And it wouldn't be exalted. You can go over to Micah chapter 4, verse 1 for that. But it would be cast into the sea. So this, mount, this Temple Mount is no longer going to be exalted but it's going to be cast into the sea. Despite the temple's historical power and holiness, it's going to be destroyed. The temple would no longer be the focal point for God's presence among the people. Jesus assures his disciples that the effectiveness of prayer has nothing to do with the temple or its sacrifices. Our relationship with God is based simply on faith and forgiveness. If one can enlist God's power by faith and find forgiveness in the kingdom, the temple has been bypassed and has become a den of robbers of no more use than a dead fig tree. And it's also interesting to note that Jesus' last recorded miracle in Mark is one of death, not of life. All of his other miracles have been about life. This one's about death, the death of the fig tree. Interesting, isn't it? Moving on to, um, there's a little bit of this in the beginning of um, verse 18. The chief priests and the scribes heard this and began seeking how to destroy him, for they were afraid of him. And then um, verses 27 through 33. The high priests and the teachers of the law fully understand the implications of Jesus' words and his action, and look for a way to kill him. How long have they been doing this? Since almost the beginning of his ministry, isn't it? They've been trying to find a way to kill him. Jesus is an outsider, and what's he doing to them? In their mind, he's usurping their authority, their power. He's taking away 
what they think belongs to them. And he's exposing them, right? And so to, to their followers. Okay, and so um, these high priests and the teachers, they fully understand the implications of Jesus' words and his action and look for a way to kill him. Jesus, an outsider, is usurping their authority. The chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Where have we seen these three put together before? Back in chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus predicts that the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders, that he's going to be brought in front of them. They challenge Jesus' authority to do these things, including teaching in the temple. In Mark, those who reproach, or who come after Jesus, never get direct answers or proof from him. As is his custom, Jesus here fends off his adversaries with his own question. He asks about John's baptism, and he twice demands an answer. Jesus' authorities, or the authorities, attempt to sidestep the challenge because they're in no win position. They don't want to lose credibility with their with their um, followers, with the crowds, or and they don't want to alienate them. Um, so they don't give him an answer. His question is, was John sent by God? Or was, let's read it. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? Was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? So, they can't answer one way because he'll say, why didn't you do it? Can't answer the other way because the crowds will get after him. So they're in a no-win situation, aren't they? They don't want to lose this credibility because, you know, the crowds are the only thing keeping them in their roles. God's not keeping them in their roles. The crowds are keeping them in their roles. And they finally admit that they can't tell the difference between what is from God or what is from men. They can't tell the difference between what's from God or what's from men or even Satan. So then Jesus comes forward with a parable. A parable of the wicked servants at the vineyard. In the beginning of chapter 12. And so the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders were some of the major landlords in Israel. And they're going to naturally sympathize with the owner of this vineyard, in this story. And we have a hard time thinking about how this works, right? But if you think about it in modern times, a sharecropper, that's even in the past 20, 30 years, someone that lives on the land takes care of the land for an owner and gives the owner a certain percentage but keeps the rest for themselves. That's kind of what's going on here. They're, somebody has built this vineyard and they're just caretaking of it. So the allegory here is a story about willful and murderous tenants who would raise the ire of any landlord. There's, there's no landlord that would put up with this. Today's world, think about squatters. Someone coming in and taking your house, taking what belongs to you because they can. That's kind of what's going on here, isn't it? They, they realize that they're the target of the story, much like Nathan and D Daniel's story, it's where Nathan said, Daniel, you are the man. And so the, what's that? He said that to David. Yeah. Um, and so the people would think of God's vineyard and who is God's vineyard? People of Israel in Isaiah 50, or 5 and verses 1 through 7. And they're seeing the difference between the care of God and the ingratitude and lack of fruitfulness of their leaders. The sending of servants and their callous rejection would be thought to be the prophets whom God sent to all people. And in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 26, he talks about how that you killed the prophets that were sent. 
the owner decided to send the son last of all. And he's identified as a son whom he loved. Who should this bring to mind right away? Jesus. Jesus. Because that's been said to Jesus a couple of times now in, in Mark. The son's supposed to be on a different level than the servants. So he sends him, assuming the servants are going to respect the son. Why would the servants respect the son? Why should the servants respect the son? Okay, his position? He's the heir, and so him being the heir, who's going to be their boss in, a very, in some point in time? The son, right? So you're certainly not going to tick off the person that's going to be over you in a short order, right? Well, what happens? The tenants recognize the son as the heir, and they want his inheritance for themselves. We've got defiance mixed with cunning, and that proves to be their final undoing. They kill him and they throw him outside, leaving him unburied. This is an incredible offense in Israelite um, time. The owner suddenly changes to one who can exact revenge. He's the owner, the Lord of the vineyard, and he'll restore the, destroy the tenants who killed his servants and his son. He will then give the vineyard to others. Jesus closes this section with passages about the block of stone discarded by the builders becoming the cornerstone or capstone of a new structure. Again, in Psalms 118, 22 and 23, we can see connections back to this. The tenant's destruction, the giving of the, of the vineyard to others, and the transformation of a rejected stone into the capstone are marvelous if we can see that this is really God's plan. We can see this through everything that he, we've just talked about, isn't it? That this is God's plan. Jesus' enemies bide their time because they fear the reaction of the fickle crowd more than they fear God. So Jesus' enemies fear the reaction of the crowd more than they fear God. Mark doesn't present Jesus despised and rejected by people, but by leaders of the people. And key aspects here we see the owner's forbearance, the tenant's foolishness, the owner's wrath, and the owner's optimism in giving the vineyard to others. That owner represents God. Moving on to, to verse 13, chapter 12. The Pharisees and the Herodians are sent to trip him up. They start by praising him on impartiality. They affirm Jesus' candor. Jesus does show partiality and does not give straight answers to those who don't seek sincerely that truth. The questions about taxes. Judea became a Roman province in 6 um, AD, and a head tax was levied. The question to Jesus is loaded. Can one pay taxes to Caesar and still give allegiance to the God of Israel? If he rejects the head tax, head tax. He'll be like the rebels who incite revolts against Rome. But if he endorses the tax, he'll undermine his own support against the zealous who chafe under this Roman rule. A yes answer is going to also throw in question being Messiah, since he was expected to depose those who held God's people captive. He asked for a coin, silver denarius, Whose face is on it? Tiberius Caesar, his face is on it. Caesar's coins belong to him. And the people that are there with him, confronting him about this, what do they use for commerce? Caesar's coins. If it's good enough to use for commerce, you need to pay Caesar. 
And so that's really where Jesus goes here. Yes. Yep, and are coins any different today? They're not really. If you go into any any country, you'll see the replica of the head of the of the state. Here we don't have as much, but we have the eagle. We have other things on there representing the government. Gary. Right. Right. Yep. That's right. So the, Gary's saying that the, in this country, you can't have a living politician on the coin. They have to be dead. Okay. Um, one may owe Caesar what bears his image and name, but one, ho- oh, one owes God what bears God's image and God's name. And what is that? Us our very selves, we're owed to God because we are in God's image. Jesus doesn't envision his church in power over governments or as a militant body exerting political force or as a church under the authority of the state as a chaplain. We are God's and are to participate in God's mission here on earth. That's who we need to be following after, is God. Does that mean we don't pay taxes? No, we pay to Caesar what's Caesar's, right? And some, this next few weeks may be very painful for some people, but we will pay, right? Because we are, we use that currency for daily living. And Jesus is saying, if you're using it, you need to pay for that, that opportunity. Moving on, then we get into 18 through 27. Here we see the Sadducees appearing for the first time in Mark they're as opponents of Jesus. And they're introduced as those who do not believe in the resurrection. They're basically a pro-priestly party that's con- that considered the five books of Moses alone as binding. And typically this is where the sect of the high priest Um, at this time came from. So Annas, Caiaphas, they were all Sadducees. And so the Sadducees bait Jesus with a question on a law that describes what should happen when a man died with no heirs. And this is out of Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10. And you remember this story, which is that a man and a wife, the man died with no children, so the wife marries the the brother, and that goes on seven times, still has no children, so whose wife is she in the resurrection? The law is primarily motivated by the desire to keep the brother's inheritance in the family. So in their story, the seven brothers were all married to the wife and died, so in the resurrection, whose wife is she? This is designed not just to trap Jesus, but to ridicule the belief in the resurrection. Remember, these people that are asking this question don't believe in the resurrection. So why would you ask this question? Other than to ridicule those that believed in the resurrection and to find a way to trip up Jesus. And behind this is an assumption that resurrection life is going to be no different than life as we experience it on earth. The Sadducees are deceived because they're ignorant of Scripture and underestimate the power of God. Jesus first corrects them on the view of the resurrection life. It doesn't mean the continuation of the same thing only longer. That's not what resurrection life is about. It's not just the same thing only longer. It's not about what I like to do here, I'm just going to keep doing. And I've heard people unfortunately say things like, I really don't like to sing that much. So if heaven's all about singing, am I going to like it? I mean, people get so turned up because 
they think the resurrection life is exactly the same as this life. Is it? It's not. Do we understand it? No, we don't. We just know it's going to be good. And the Sadducees, they're, they're coming at this from a, the wrong perspective. In the resurrection, we're transfigured into a new dimension of life that we've never experienced. And we've never talked to anybody that's experienced it. Jesus then reminds them of the burning bush passage that identifies God as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all in present tense. And he emphasizes that they're mistaken in their beliefs. Belief in the resurrection doesn't derive from what we can prove, but rather it's the faith in the power of God to do as he says. That's what resurrection is all about, is our faith in the power of God to do as he says. It's not that I can prove anything about the resurrection, because I can't. So that's where we're going to end today, but I got some questions for you, since we got a couple of minutes. Until now, Jesus has avoided calling attention to himself, telling people to be quiet after his miracles and revealing messianic identity. Why do you think he shifts and makes this dramatic entrance into the city? Why do you think he shifts now? Alpheus. Where are we on a timeline right now? Where we we're, we're about the last eight week or eight days of Jesus' life. Okay, we're we're in that final week, and that final week is important, right? And is there any time now to just keep everything under covers? It's time to let it out. Yeah. Time to let it out, and that's what's going on here. In um, chapter 12, verses 1 through 9, what's Jesus saying here in the parable of the vineyard? And what does it say about Jewish leaders that hear this and still go forward with killing Jesus? Jesus is saying about the, the owner and the son, he's making it very clear, isn't he? What does this say about the religious leaders that are listening to him? They didn't know what the prophets taught, but they're not listening. No. He's telling them, but they're not listening. Right. They're not putting it together, are they? So where is God's image to be found? If Caesar's image is found on a coin, where is God's image to be found? Our hearts. Our hearts. Every one of us, it's in us, okay? God's image is in us. And what difference does our hope and resurrection make to our lives now? It makes everything, doesn't it? It makes every, every difference. And, and so it, life is pretty tough without a belief in the resurrection, isn't it? If you can think about all the things you go through and how that hope of that resurrection can carry you through. Yes, sir. That's the importance of the resurrection. Yes, sir. That changes our perspective on life so dramatically. Yes. So next time we're going to move through um, the end of chapter 12 and all of chapter 13. So, plan on that. Yeah, Gary. It's interesting to me that the people put their coats or their clothing on the way to the Lord, common people with what they had. It's all they had. That's all, right. all they had. Very similar to Bartimaeus. All he had, he left, right? His cloak. And so it's, yeah, they just leave it all. Put it underneath the feet of donkey. Yes. What, is, what happens to coats when they get stomped on by donkeys? Don't have a lot of personal experience, but I, I, I think they get cut up. They get ripped. 
Yeah, Alpheus. 